political crimes. I will not uh, uh, list such provisions at this place, however, I would uh, like to say that a part of them related to acts of speech. Incriminated utterances, depending on their contents and scope of impact in the society, could be interpreted differently and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, legal uh, qualification could be different. Few examples of uh, prosecuted acts were disseminating untrue or distorted statements liable to undermine the prosperity of the Reich or authority of the Reich government. Uh, such type were uh, punishable by imprisonment or severe prison. Uh, after the outbreak of the uh, World War II, on top of that, uh, a so-called uh, radio offense was introduced, uh, consisting in the dissemination of um, in information originating from foreign radio programs. Uh, in particular, severe cases, even death penalty could be imposed. Um, adjudication in political matters in the Reich was a matter of special courts, German uh, Sondergericht, um, and in more severe cases, a matter of higher regional courts, uh, Oberlandesgericht, and uh, the People's Tribunal, uh, Volksgerichtshof. Uh, special attention in the criminal law of uh, the Reich was given to the regulation on special wartime criminal law of August 1938, uh, that piece of legislation introduced a completely new type of uh, prohibited act. It was decomposing impact on the armed forces. The act consisted in publicly, it's important, in publicly promotion uh, or calling on to refuse to follow the military service obligation or in publicly, publicly paralyzing uh, or undermining the will of the German nation oriented towards the nation's armed self-determination. It's, it's uh, legislation definition. Uh, the act was even subject to death penalty. Uh, the cited piece of legislation was applied in the title case against the, uh, the Polish farmer. This farmer, Nazi Kaczmarek, uh, was a head uh, of a large family. Uh, in the past, he had work in, worked as a miner. Uh, already before the Second World War, he bought a farm in Katowice, um, which supported him during the war. Uh, in his neighborhood, he was uh, known for his pro-Polish uh, views and pro-Polish beliefs. Uh, we know from the file of uh, German criminal procedure that in March uh, 1943, uh, Kaczmarek went to a livestock dealer named Radka uh, to buy a pig, an animal. Uh, both men talk about other things. Kaczmarek promised uh, to visit Radka again on the following day, uh, which is uh, why the latter called a gendarme, a policeman, uh, who on that um, very next day was listening in another room uh, from behind a partially open door um, to what Kaczmarek was saying. Uh, during the next day visit, uh, Pied Radka, Kaczmarek said, among others, uh, that Bolsheviks had better weapons than uh, Germans, that Polish guerrillas uh, supported by America crushed German posts, uh, that Poland will be independent again and that it will be larger at uh, the expense of Germany, uh, that German uh, nation did not trust the Führer Adolf Hitler. Uh, in April 1943, uh, Kaczmarek was arrested by the police, by Gestapo, and at the beginning of May, uh, he was in pretrial detention. Uh, in April uh, 1944, his bill of indictment was drawn up and the trial before the higher regional court in Katowice took place. Uh, the trial was uh, presided over by the head of the criminal senate, Herbert Zirpel, and uh, two another uh, judges. Uh, it was uh, Walter Scheiblich and Gerhard Wede. I uh, cite the names of the lawyers because uh, um, I involved in the process because it will be relevant in the context of, uh, of the post-war procedures. Uh, Kaczmarek was sentenced to death for this Wegkaftzersetzung. 
uh, Kaczmarek's utterances were obviously found uh, decomposing and bearing in mind their contents, such qualification does not raise doubts. Uh, out of the extensive justification of the judgment, I would like to comment uh, on two important uh, questions. First, uh, Kaczmarek's words were found to have been uttered publicly, um, even though uh, they had been uttered in a private apartment to only one person. Of course, Kaczmarek didn't know that, that in another room there's a, a policeman, so the, the, the second man. The court so concluded because, in the court's opinion, uh, Kaczmarek accepted the fact that his inter interlocutor would not keep the news here to himself and that the interlocutor uh, would further pass them on. Uh, another question referred to the degree of penalty. Um, the court did not find any attenuating uh, circumstances, although one could establish such circumstances with a little goodwill. Uh, Kaczmarek gave explanations, uh, had a clean criminal record, uh, except for a minor penalty. Um, he was a um, 62 year old chatterer. Uh, his, son, um, his son was in the Wehrmacht, and the utterance proven to him was one of statement. Uh, for the sake of comparison, I analyzed uh, other decisions, other judgments uh, preserved in Berlin archives uh, of the higher regional court in Katowice, with the same uh, legal uh, qualification, of course. Uh, on the um, whole, uh, I found 59 uh, such judgments delivered between May 1943 and December 1944. Uh, apart from Kaczmarek case, only in one other situation that penalty was imposed. Uh, uh, the death sentence imposed on Kaczmarek was executed one month later with a guillotine. Uh, the next case uh, about the uh, confident. In uh, 1945, already before a Polish court, under the decree of August, uh, the Polish decree of August uh, 1944, an informant Wilhelm Przybyła was held liable. Uh, by his activities, collaboration uh, with the Gestapo, he led to the detention of many Poles, who were later uh, sent to a concentration camps and died there. Uh, he also contributed directly to the detention by the Gestapo of Kaczmarek, uh, who initially avoided arrest and began to hide. Um, the informant Przybyła was sentenced to death penalty, and uh, his case uh, can even be considered a model procedure when it comes to liability for collaboration uh, with the occupier. Uh, the German lawyers uh, involved in Kaczmarek's case survived the war. Uh, Zirpel, so Herbert Zirpel uh, and uh, Walter Scheiblich died shortly after the war. Uh, the last uh, uh, lawyer, uh, Wede, in 1953 started to work in the judicial system of uh, West Germany and Pchalek, the prosecutor, uh, uh, worked in the uh, prosecutor's office of East Germany. Uh, the case of Pchalek, so of the prosecutor, uh, the criminal proceedings against Pchalek were initiated uh, uh, by chance. Uh, in February 1959 in uh, the German Democratic Republic, uh, an exhibition was held devoted to the operation of uh, um, bloodthirsty uh, courts and bloodthirsty uh, judges, as the courts uh, and judges of the Third Reich uh, were then referred to. It was an element of propaganda campaign against the Federal Republic of Germany. One of, um, one of the um, exhibition uh, elements was a photocopy of the death sentence delivered against Kaczmarek. A student uh, visiting the exhibition uh, paid attention to the surname of public prosecutor Pchalek, who at that time was a lecturer of criminal law at the University of Vienna. Uh, the student reported her discovery to the prosecutor's office. Uh, finally, uh, Pchalek was sentenced to four years, uh, to four years uh, of prison and his activities in the occupied Polish uh, territories 
uh, especially the request for imposing capital punishment uh, on 20 defendants were qualified as accessory to murder. Uh, the accusations made in the German Democratic Republic in 1960 uh, against uh, bloodfist judges began to reach Stuttgart, uh, where Gerhard Wedder was working at the regional court. Uh, first, uh, Wedder was asked to take position with regard to the news and the, um, the criminal uh, proceedings was uh, initiated against him. Um, uh, I wish to point out that thus the criminal proceedings against Wedder were discontinued. Uh, reason. Uh, his line of defense was that during the second judge's meeting, uh, when the judges um, discussed uh, the sentence in Katmark's case, he was the only one to vote against that penalty. Uh, since the two other members, the two other judges uh, uh, of the adjudicating panel were already dead at that time, such statement uh, could not be verified or uh, rebutted. Uh, and the conclusion, uh, um, this Katmark's case uh, uh, was only one of many uh, cases incriminating the German judicial system during the war. It allows to take an individual perspective on uh, more, more general phenomena or gen more general uh, problems, uh, political crimes in the future, the operation of the judicial system or settlements of the uh, World War II. In addition, the case uh, generally confused as the findings uh, of other researchers concerning post-war liability. Uh, in the German Democratic Republic, uh, sentencing of lawyers uh, took place, and uh, in the Federal Republic of Germany, no judge or prosecutor of the Fiat Reich was finally sentenced. Uh, thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Glaczek, for your presentation. We will now move to the next one. Uh, and the next speaker hardly needs an introduction because uh, she was in touch with uh, all of you. Uh, but still to do my duty, uh, Dr. Sonia Hronziak, um, she's my colleague from the Polish Academy of Sciences Scientific Center in Vienna. She holds a PhD in uh, political science from the Jagiellonian University. Uh, her work is on um, inter alia uh, polarization, political anthropology, hate speech, and also law and memory. Sonia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, and yeah, it is uh, it is a pleasure, but also bizarre to stand here as an organizer and also as a researcher in the same time. But nevertheless, uh, I would like to present the case that probably to our Polish speakers is known very very well. Trust me when I say this. Probably, if you mention this, 90% uh, uh, of Poles they will know about it. They will have this, their stance about it. They will analyze this case in uh, many details. But I know there are uh, some of you, maybe, or our viewers during the stream that are not familiar in this case. And I think it's a pretty interesting example. Uh, on how uh, memorial laws, or more to say defamation laws, uh, come in clash with some uh, values that we tend to assume are de democratic, that is, for example, freedom of research. And uh, therefore, I'm going to say about the Dalai's Notes research publication uh, and uh, the story uh, behind it, and uh, just to say this story we could say that ended this year, but maybe not entirely. I will come to this uh, later. But uh, first, we, let me just uh, refer to the past for a moment, but not so uh, not, not, not much, much of the past. So in 2010, uh, in Poland, as many of you probably know, because this is actually uh, this was actually an international also case, uh, Institute of National Remembrance, that is Institute Pamięci Narodowej, they uh, introduce a new amendment to the, to the Act on the Institute of National Remembrance. 
And uh, there are a couple of controversial articles uh, on this uh, amendment. One of those is Article 55A, and just to uh, briefly summarize it, uh, it is basically stated that whoever claims publicly and contrary to the facts that Polish nation or Republic of Poland is responsible or co-responsible for Nazi crimes, uh, crimes or, for example, who uh, grossly diminishes the responsibility of the true perpetrators shall be liable to a fine or imprisonment up to three years. So uh, basically we have a uh, very strict uh, memory law here at uh, present. Of course, uh, let me say this uh, amendment was actually uh, uh, re uh, entirely revoked, so it does not apply, apply anymore. But just to remember this, uh, why I am mentioning this? Because during that time there was uh, two types of reactions for this uh, new amendment. Of course there were a couple of more articles to it. But uh, there were international reactions and there were the Polish reactions, uh, like in, from insider's position. And the Polish reactions mainly, mainly focus about who actually is the subject of this amendment and in what circumstances can he uh, be prosecuted. That is, uh, it was interpreted that maybe, based on this regulation, the freedom of uh, researchers will be, uh, will be in danger. But actually, as we can also see in this article, it's clearly stated that no offense is committed if the criminal act uh, is committed in the course of one artistic or academic activity. Of course, that draws another question. What about the teacher's activity, uh, teaching in schools? Are there also, uh, maybe won't be uh, allowed to teach about some controversial facts from the Polish history? Nevertheless, this is just to uh, give you the context of the discussion that was back then uh, one of the main topics in Poland regarding the memory laws. As I was saying, this amendment was entirely revoked. And then we skip back a little bit to the future, uh, to the next year, when the publication of this book, Dalej is not, uh, happens. Uh, as you see, the English title is Night Without Fear, the end of the fate of Jews in selected counties of occupied Poland. And of course, even before the book was published, it struck quite a big amount of controversy. Controversy because uh, some, uh, some claimed that this uh, research were actually poorly done, uh, that for example, testimonies, because it mainly focuses on the Jewish his, uh, history of Jews living in Poland during the wartime, uh, and uh, for example, some claimed that the testimonies of the uh, Jewish people or their descendants were uh, in f when favored in comparison to the testimonies of the Poles. So, of course, it struck uh, controversy that it sheds a bad light on the uh, Poles, Poles during the Second World War, Poles after Second World War, and Poland in general. But, of course, it is all within the freedom of speech, freedom of research, to criticize any publication that goes public. It's, it's pretty uh, understandable. But it changed, it changed uh, on the June 17, 2019, because the co-editors of the book and authors uh, of the chapters, uh, because uh, this publication had many authors of the chapters, but two co-auditors, that is Professor Barbara Engelking and Professor Jan Grabowski, uh, were, were sued by uh, the niece of the uh, Edward Malinowski, a person uh, who was portrayed in this book, uh, that is by Filomena Leszczyńska, for infringement of her personal rights by defaming Malinowski. And to understand this case, I would just like to briefly tell you what, uh, what the story actually was about. So in this publication, we have the character of Edward Malinowski, the mayor of the Polish village uh, of Malinovo, who after the Second World War was tried on the responsibility of extradicting Jews uh, to, the, uh, to the Nazis, contributing uh, therefore to their uh, death. He was tried on this. And uh, to give you the context, in Poland in November 1942, uh, Germans begin to liquidate the, uh, the ghettos that uh, they previously put and transport the uh, people from the ghettos to the uh, basically uh, extermination camps. So 
Everyone in that time knew that this transportation meant death. Therefore, of course, it struck a lot of, a lot of people began to escape. And one of the escapees was Estera Szymiatycka, who is also portrayed uh, uh, in this book. Uh, she was, of course, a Jew, uh, Jewish person. And in one moment of her tragic journey, she came across Edward Malinowski, the aforementioned mayor of this uh, city, and asked him for help. And in the book, there is a testimony uh, stating that he, uh, in his way of helping her, he stripped her of her belongings, uh, he took half of her money, but afterwards, he indeed took her to the uh, German gendarmes at, uh, at the border and stated that she is actually another Polish person, therefore, he contributed to saving her life. This is the, the, the one uh, case of a, one sentence of this book. The other, uh, the book then presents uh, the further story, uh, the further story of Malinowski and the aforementioned trial. And actually, uh, he was uh, tried, later accused of collaborating with the Germans and hurting the villagers, and as I was saying, handing over to the gendarmes 18 Jews hidden in the forest of village of Malinovo. And of course, the trial began after the Second World War. Uh, there were many controversies surrounding him, there were many testimonies, and one of the testimonies came directly from Estera Szymiantycka, who survived Second World War, and she actually testified that uh, he helped her, he fed her, he saved her life. And now on, like, it, should be, uh, it should be end of the story, but actually the book quotes another testimony of the same person, of Estera, from many years later, uh, from uh, 1996, and then she said that if it weren't for her, she, uh, he would have uh, become death penalty, because you have to know that this uh, Edward Malinowski was actually accused of, uh, this, uh, uh, cleared of this accusation. But in 1996, Estera states that actually she, uh, he did her a lot of harm. Yes, he contributed to, to saving her by, by stating that she's this Polish woman, but he did her a lot of harm. And if it weren't for her testimony, he would for sure uh, become uh, this, uh, he will be sentenced to death because he was uh, actually contributing to, to those crimes and atrocities. And this is the end of the story. So based on this basis, there were actually three sentences in this book that were objected to. And based on this, uh, Professor Engel King, who is an author of this chapter and co-editor of the book, Rian Grabowski, were sued by the uh, Filomena Leszczyńska, this niece of uh, the mayor. And uh, for, as I was saying, it was for infringement of her personal rights by the Femming Malinowski. And at this moment, this is not the controversial case. Of course, Filomena Leszczyńska had the right to do this. Why, why wouldn't he? There's a, there's a law stating that if someone's perf uh, someone is defamated, his personal rights are infringed, there shouldn't be any problem. But actually, how this trial and how this um, What's third controversy were three distinct matters that I would like to uh, show you right now. So, uh, first of all, the amount of claimed uh, compensation and its repercussions. Because uh, Filomena Leszczyńska uh, was actually an elderly lady that uh, was um, represented by lawyers coming from the Polish League Against Defamation. In Polish, this is Fundacja Reduta Dobrego Imienia. And in her name, they actually uh, wanted a compensation, seeked a compensation in an amount of 100,000 Polish zloty, and of course, uh, apology to be printed in the newspaper. And there is actually no doubt that if the compensation, uh, if uh, the authors of the book would have to pay, uh, pay them 100,000 zloty of the compensation, that could burden them, uh, bury them financially. And uh, what's more, the discussion began about the chilling effect of the ruling that would uh, say that they have to actually not only apologize but also pay. Because then everyone who would probably try to uh, recreate the history, present the history, the, this difficult part of history where maybe not everyone is a hero as we would like them to be seen, then uh, 
maybe they will stop uh, from the attempts of conducting such a research because they will be fearing that anyone can actually sue them over for that amount and basically ruin them finan financially. But this is just one thing. The other thing was the issue of credibility of research. So, uh, and this is actually pretty interesting case because uh, if you think about it, on what grounds can the court, any court if that you might imagine, state that this research were done poorly? Like, what knowledge, uh, what can we expect from the judges uh, during, the, uh, during the prosecution? Like, uh, do you expect the judges to actually know and recreate the research that took for many, many uh, years that was gathering uh, many statements uh, that was finding buried documentation uh, regarding this, this case and the events uh, presented in this book. This is not a um, short paper, this is a couple hundred pages uh, research publication by the uh, congregation of researchers who uh, actually worked on this publication for a couple of years. And this is the question, like on what basis, what experts outside the researchers that actually done the research can be uh, can be asked if this uh, research is actually done properly or improperly and therefore they uh, actually willingly defamed uh, the given uh, Mayor Malinowski. And the third uh, thing that I would like to point out, and maybe the most interesting given the title uh, of uh, today's conference, is the case of national identity and pride. Because, as I was saying, the case of infringement of personal rights is nothing uh, exceptional about this case. But the lawyers of uh, Ms. Leszczyńska uh, not only uh, wanted to protect somehow her personal rights, but also demanded the protection of national identity and pride, uh, stating that actually anyone who feels Polish should be able to sue anyone who express a critical assessment to the Polish nation. They, they used this logic that uh, because uh, Edward Malinowski was a Pole and this publication defames him, then this publication defames, not Edward Malinowski, defames the Polish nation, the Polish nation, the Polish uh, image during, during and after the Second World uh, War. And uh, it, uh, they, they argued that basically uh, the pride of, uh, this is the direct quote, the pride of the entire nation was damaged. And uh, to tell you how this uh, case actually revolved. So we have two, uh, actually two court sentences. Um, so in February 2021, uh, a Warsaw court ruled that uh, Grabowski and Engelking must apologize for the claims about Malinowski, but did not order them to pay any compensation. But actually, in, uh, the court justified the judgment that stating that assigning responsibility to the Polish nation for the Holocaust, so not to the Edward Malinowski, to the Polish nation for the Holocaust, potentially violates the personal well-being of every Pole. So this actually could open the window for every Pole uh, suing actually I don't know, researcher of the, uh, maybe researchers, maybe anyone else who are stating some facts about the uh, historical facts about the difficult past. Because they are Polish, the Polish nation is, uh, the Polish pr pride of the Polish nation is at stake. And uh, actually, just to uh, clarify this, even if uh, the notion of the Polish nation and responsibility of Polish nation was mentioned here. It did not apply uh, in the ruling to this case. So the uh, court also said that although uh, every Pole should have this right, Filomena Leszczyńska actually was presented, or the court thinks that she was presented more as a niece than uh, of the defamated uh, Malinowski than as a Pole uh, protecting another Pole from being defamed. So this case, uh, so the court only mentioned that if the case were presented differently, then maybe the ruling will also be different. But of course, uh, maybe not of course, but uh, Grabowski and Engelkin appealed from the verdict, and this year in August, uh, an appealed court overturned the February ruling, stating that the interference in scientific research 
is not the task of courts. So you can see the quote, uh, I've tried to <laughs> translate it as accurately as it gets. So uh, the Court of Appeals stated that if the court were to decide the credibility of historical source, uh, sources, or to impose uh, what sources they should, uh, I don't know, make their findings or find uh, them, then such actions would constitute an accept, uh, unacceptable form of censorship and interference with the freedom of research and scientific work. So this ruling, the other rulings, of course, uh, the whole claim was uh, re uh, revoked. So uh, Barbara uh, Engelking and Jan Grabowski do not have to apologize or pay any uh, compensation. But of course, as I was saying in the beginning, it struck quite of the discussion because the ruling, and uh, not only the ruling, but the justification of the court of the first instance actually uh, give this window or the permission for the uh, further cases. So I think that's all for me. Thank you so much. Dr. Haronczak, thank you very much. I, I, I think we will have a discussion after your presentation as well. But before uh, uh, we uh, move to discussion, we have a third uh, uh, talk uh, in this panel. Um, uh, so I welcome Dr. Petra Shvardova from our sister institution, um, the Slovak Academy of Sciences. Uh, I appreciate that you came in spite of some difficulties. Um, you, uh, our speaker, she uh, um, uh, holds PhD uh, from a, I guess, very interesting uh, uh, program run by three institutions, Slovak Academy of Sciences, Comenius University, and Inalco uh, Paris. Um, the topic of the doctoral dissertation was material heritage from the communist past in the former Czechoslovakia and Bulgaria, the questions of preservation of monuments and their new role, Soviet war memorials after 1989. Uh, earlier she completed her master's degree in museum studies uh, in Paris Sorbonne University. Um, and the topic, um, topic is closely related to her main uh, fields of research when the monuments fall, the case of the communist era monuments after 1989 in Czechoslovakia. Dr. Švardova, first yours. I was struggling with some technical yeah, problems. So it seems to me that you know, computers are more reliable for online conferences than yeah. on-site <laughs> ones. <laughs> I, I see it here. Yeah. Can, do you have another, another key? Hmm? Do you have another? So apparently it is not just about memory clashes, it is also <laughs> about IT infrastructure yeah, clashes. Our, that's, fortunately, we have our oh, technical you. support with us here, so and we will try to. Yeah. If it's work, on and I can look at. This is a shortcut. Yeah. This is a shortcut, I guess. 
but this is not a file. That, but this does it right. work? Uh, it leads somewhere to a file that is somewhere else. Maybe, just, uh, okay, just maybe save. Now. Maybe now do it and save it directly on the drive no, uh, okay. once, once more. We'll manage. <laughs> Sorry for complication. No, 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 don't worry. So this is one of the conferences when the technical break is almost as long as a lunch break. <laughs> Where I can find it? Here? It's this one. Yeah, 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 this is one. Yeah, and it's later to name these. I don't know why it's called. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, sorry for sorry for the complication. <laughs> Thank you for uh, for the invitation. And uh, now my topic uh, calls When Monuments Fall, the case of Communist Era Monument after 89 in Czechoslovakia. So uh, the event of November 89 in Czechoslovakia had a, an immense impact uh, on the public space. And the monument, of course, the monument uh, situated there. The changes, in some cases, uh, irrever irreversible, also affected the monuments, especially those associated with the communist past. So in this paper, uh, I would like to fo focus on the question related to this political representation, their legislative norm and protection during the Velvet Revolution in uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, so first, uh, the first part I will I will speak about the public space in 89. Uh, as we can know, the, the falls and rises uh, of one political regime are usually characterized by the destruction of the icons, uh, icons of the previous system and the construction of the symbol marking a new beginning. Each new dominative group tries to remove the old symbols and legitimized its power by building the new ones. Slovak historian Lubomil, Lubomir Liptak claims uh, that every new religion, opinion, ideology, and power demarcates the new acquired space. Okay. okay. This one. At the beginning of December 89, communist symbol, as you can see here, and uh, also ideological slogans, as you can see here, and uh, also red stars uh, started to be massively removed from uh, Czechoslovakian streets. Later, later, <laughs> no, where are you? Okay, later the same destiny hit the monument, uh, celebrated the communist regime and the communist leaders. Uh, the cities reacted to the frequent deterioration of the monuments by creating the special commission, which took a measure to avoid uh, the destruction and vandalization. Uh, the problematic uh, statue uh, and monuments were very quickly wrapped or covered by the blanket and uh, other materials. A uh, very human opinion of Czechoslovak society, society protected the contested object of their complete destruction and encouraged their transfer to the depositories of the museum and, uh, and the galleries. Um, in this time, appeared also the idea of creating of Czechoslovak open air museums of the communist past. However, uh, an unfortu uh, unfortunately, this plan was never, never realized. Some monuments, uh, some monuments have undergone a very unusual metamorphosis in the form of recycling the material to create another statue uh, or uh, to selling it uh, abroad. The first uh, monument which disappeared from the public space were the statue of the main leaders and protagonist of communist regime 
uh, between Gottwald, Lenin, Fuchik, Milesian men, and especially the emblems of cycle and uh, hammer. Consequently, uh, also disappeared the monument of Czechoslovak and Soviet friendship, monument of working class, and other visual illustration of the communist ideology. The removal from the pedestal started already in December 89 and have progressed during all the year of 1990. Uh, the toppling uh, the monuments culminated around the years 94 and 95, but also we know about the recent cases. For example, like here, are the, the cases of statue of uh, Marshal Konev in Prague. Uh, the, this statue was removed uh, last year during the pandemic. Uh, so uh, now, now I will uh, pass to the second, uh, second part of my presentation, and it's called Legislation of Communist Era Monuments. Almost, mof, uh, almost most of the pro-regime pro monuments building, uh, built during communism were listed in the catalog of cultural monuments. So their statue, status was like a cultural monument. There was, they had a, a special uh, protection than, uh, than other, other monuments. The National Monument Board control their condition and also protect them from a deterioration. Basically, the same principle of protection works in Czech Republic, uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia, and I, I think it's the same in Poland or in every post-communist country. The current uh, norms proceed from the time of socialist Czechoslovakia. The first legislative norm which regulates the protection of the cultural monument came from 1958, and it arose from the post-war experience and, uh, and, and the difficulty of the confiscated object, the need to control the state property, its cultural and historical values. Under the cultural monument, the law understood each object with cultural, historical, and architectural attributes. Uh, after 89, the institute continued uh, with the regulation and laws from socialist Slovakia, more precisely with the law from uh, uh, 1987, determining the protection of uh, the important cultural and historical object. In the 1990, uh, the Ministry of Culture initiated the process of the cancellation of the statues, the Prorazi monument, as a cultural monument. Presently, the Ministry of Culture of Czech Republic considers the cultural monuments or sites from the ideological and political perspective with the objective to assign a status of cultural herit heritage only to those which are linked with authentic place of historical events are uh, historical event are authentic object to do commemorate a personality significant for all state citizens or are of outstanding artistic value. <laughs> According uh, to the monument law from uh, 87, the towns and municipality uh, assured the protection of the monument because they, uh, they were uh, owner. The owner is obliged and his on, uh, on his own expense to conserve the cultural heritage, to keep it in good shape and protect it against danger, damage, uh, damage depreciation or theft. Um, all intervention and modification or relocation of the monument had to be reported directly to the Ministry of Culture. In this regard, we can say that the removal, removal of the most uh, monuments uh, from this time, uh, of I mean 89 and 90, that means before the removal from the list uh, of cultural monuments, was against uh, this conception of uh, monument, monument love. The relocation of the contested monument was very often approved by the local councils. So at least these decision, uh, decisions were par uh, partially legalized by the state authority. A more difficult situation uh, occurred with the monuments which were destroyed. Removal of the registered cultural monuments before its removal from the list of cultural monuments authorized the national committees to impose a financial penalization. However, this never happened, uh, happened not only because of a chaotic situation in Czechoslovakia, but also because the national committees as a state administration bodies uh, ceases to exist in 1990. 
Uh, of course, uh, not all monuments that symbolize the communist regime or uh, built uh, from uh, built in communist era have been removed from the list of cultural monuments. Special group uh, in this discussion uh, about uh, removal create the memorials related to the war. Most of them kept the, the statues of culture monument. These monuments are regulated by the law about, the, about war graves. The legislative norm which regulated protection of this type of monument are controlled not only by domestic law, but also international convention and treaties. Uh, here it's, uh, I speak, uh, of course, about the Soviet war memorial. Uh, I will pass in the, sec uh, in the third the third part of my presentation, uh, and it calls the communist monument as a cultural or historical heritage. It's my question, it's not an <laughs> opinion. Can we un understand the monument built during the communist, uh, communism as a cultural heritage? What exactly it means by the definition of cultural heritage and when a monument become a cultural heritage or historical heritage? So the declaration of the National Council of Slovak Republic on the preservation of cultural heritage def defines this as, allow this, uh, this as follows. Under cultural heritage are identified tangible and intangible values, movable and immovable objects, including important works and ideas, which in Slovakia found their purpose. Archival documents are recognized as the tangible values of cultural heritage, regardless uh, of the means of preservation of information, as well as manuscript, and found in libraries, literary works, scenographic design works, cinematography, TV production, audiovisual works, museum and art collection works of visual applied and folk art designed, architectural object, urbanistic area, archaeological, arch 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 archaeological sites and uh, discoveries, folk, architecture, uh, and others. <laughs> but as you can see, uh, never, uh, no one time we speak about the monuments or uh, which one monuments we have to introduce in this law. Uh, so now I will speak about the international legislative. Uh, before I, uh, I was speaking about the Slovak uh, le legal norms. So the international legislative norm contains several important conventions that deal not only with the protection of the monuments, but also with the tangible and intangible object of historical and cultural significance. Under the auspice of the United Nations, the world famous organization UNESCO describes the instruction of the protection of cultural heritage. In 1972, the General Conference of UNESCO was held in Paris and resulted in the Convention Concerning the Protection of the War, Cultural and Natural Heritage. Uh, the aim of, uh, of this convention was to ensure the protection, preservation, and uh, presentation of the most important cultural and natural heritage sites of global importance. The Convention identifies uh, the monuments as a part of cultural heritage. Architectural object works of monumental sculpture and painting, elements of structure of an archaeological nature, uh, inscription, cave dwellings, and combination of future, which are outstanding universes, universal value from the point of view of history, art, or science. So uh, communist monuments were never included in this list, as you can understand. First of all, because they become from the relatively recent past. And the question is if the monuments built during the communist regime and describe the communist ide ideology appertain to the worldwide cultural, uh, cultural and historical heritage. So there are also uh, other international law describe the protection and list of cultural heritage, uh, international char charter for the preservation of historical sites, ICOMOS, ICOMOS from the 1987, or Venice Charter on the protection of restoration of the monuments and uh, from uh, 1964. The Council of Europe Framework Convention of the Value of Cultural Heritage for Society is considered less strict than other conventions and agreements. In many aspects, respect 
current societal demands. Some experts describes the, uh, describes the, the, this convention as a testimony of new European generation. Um, cultural, cultural heritage is a group of resources inherited from the past, which people identify independently of ownership uh, as a reflection and expression of their constantly evolving values, beliefs, knowledge, and tradition. So the question still remains whether the, uh, the communist era monuments are per perceived as a world cultural heritage or at least as a cultural heritage in the country where they are loca located. So now I will, uh, I will conclude. Uh, uh, the Velvet Revolution in November 89 had a huge impact in, uh, on the public space and also the monument. In addition uh, to the political demands to eliminate a dysfunctional regime, the effort of Czechoslovak citizens focused on the so-called desecration of the most important symbols of communist ideology. Iconoclasm was understood as a symbolic condemnation of this old structure. Uh, most of the monuments built during communism uh, were removed with uh, revolu revolutionary enthusiasm, but also this act violated the legal norms uh, of this time. On the other hand, the society, society did not take in consideration the legal system of communist regime. The majority of communist era statues and other symbols of communism, communism were hidden from the public eyes and until now are stored in the museum depositories. The domestic and international legal system are not clear if we can consider the communist era monument as a cultural and historical heritage. Neither the Czech and Slovak societies are not ready to retain, uh, to retain their, their statues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I invite all the speakers uh, for a round of discussion, Q&A. Uh, a, a little remark uh, from Poland. Uh, it is an ongoing discussion that hits up every couple of years, the idea to tear down the uh, uh, Palace of Culture and Science in Warsaw, which we follow um, in this sp with special attention because the headquarters of the Polish Academy of Sciences happen to be in this very place. Uh, 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 yes, uh, this is, uh, I think, something that is in a way common to most post socialist countries. Uh, we have heard three presentations. Uh, and now we can um, collect questions that you can address directly to the speakers. Uh, please. Yes, it will be better for the recording, I guess. So I will. Um, hi, uh, Gary Simpson, LSE. So, Sonia and Petra, I had a question for each of you. Uh, uh, well, my, my question for Sonia is really more of a comment. Uh, your discussion of defamation reminded me of David Irving again, whose name has come up because he brought a def defamation case against uh, Deborah Lipstadt, the historian in England, oh, about 15 to 20 years ago. And uh, he lost that case and in a way lost his credibility entirely. Um, so it might be worth looking at defamation cases uh, elsewhere. There was another one in Scotland, in fact, involving an Anthony Geras, G-E-R-A-S. So sometimes war crimes and history, for example, get litigated in libel cases rather, in, rather than in war crimes trials. Uh, Petra, I wanted to ask you inevitably about your response to the recent uh, destruction of uh, memorials to slave traders in the United Kingdom and what you thought about that. I mean, I, I got the impression that you, I, mean, I got the impression from your photographs at least that you favored, rather than preservation or destruction, which are the two alternatives we're always presented with, you were in favor of something a bit more playful, where they were dressed up in some way uh, or repurposed in some way in perhaps an ironic form. 
the question is whether you're in favor of that rather than the, either the destruction or the preservation of monuments. So uh, maybe I will also respond with a comment uh, then. Just uh, um, maybe uh, an information from Poland that actually when it comes to defamation cases, in the last year the number of defamation cases, I wouldn't say... Uh, tripled but double for sure and I'm not talking only about the defamation cases when it comes to the history to the past I'm also talking about the the roles in the defamation cases when it comes to the occurrences of the everyday life uh, uh, also now in Poland we have now the cases of someone defining the name of the president of Poland we have the case of someone defining the uh, mother Mary who is portrayed with the rainbow uh, areola around her head so I think it's in Poland actually this is this is the rising trend uh, when it comes to those uh, those cases uh, not only in the historical sense but uh, in general works okay so you can hear me uh, so my position uh, there uh, it's not it's not really clear uh, I uh, to explain you I'm now in the, in the postdoctoral um, uh, project and this is my this is my uh, uh, th thema, thematic and uh, I will start only in January so this is a very uh, Part or beginning of my of my research. So, if we can meet, uh, <laughs> I think in two or one year, I can explain you more. I'm sure. But now uh, I'm I'm just observing uh, the situation there, and of course the legal uh, the legal status of these monuments because it's really I think it's really important to know uh, where or when we can consider this monument as a, a historical uh, heritage. This is not clear, and I think the societies, so Czech or Slovak or Pol, and, and the others uh, of uh, post-communist regime are not ready to to rethink this this status. And I don't know. I will I will observe it more, and uh, maybe if you can meet in one year or two, I can tell you more. I, I would like. To to make, uh, uh, before we uh, start with the next question, I would like to add some additional comments to your question, Jerry, about this uh, 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 cases based on uh, defamation. So, uh, to conceptualize this, I think it, it could be uh, understood as um, a private enforcement of a certain public policy. Because uh, the most controversial questions were about um, criminal sanctions, because criminal law is telling you have always state apparatus behind, uh, you have public prosecutors, so it is very easy to see it is at hand that it is a state that is pushing towards a certain policy. Whenever instead of criminal sanctions you have civil law and you have individual story from this let's say, diplomatic perspective, it feels more efficient. And I think you need to look at this on a case-by-case uh, case basis. Uh, it all started over in Poland with the notorious um, phrase, Polish death camp. And the first claimants to sue, uh, resorting to civil law remedies, protection of individual rights based on infringement, were the ones who were either themselves directly uh, imprisoned in those camps, and now they read or hear of Polish death camps when they themselves were uh, imprisoned in those camps, or their children so this was the, typic, the, the first series of cases. Or also, um, resistance home army uh, suing for uh, the way the Polish home army was portrayed 
in a German movie that uh, the, um, in German it was Unsere Mutter, Unsere Vetter, uh, the global edition was Generation War. And the, this movie portrays the army uh, as uh, very anti-Semitic. And the climates were basically the people who by their individual history could say this is something that we feel as very offensive. But on the other side, so this is just the part of the story. The other, other part is, and this is very visible in the case that Sonia was describing, uh, even though we have individual plaintiff, still behind her, you have an organization. So basically, frankly speaking, this elder lady probably would never find out about what was written about her relative. And it was actually an activism of an organization that is in a way also linked to the state. And they were the ones to uh, search for this woman to have somebody to be put in place as a plaintiff for the case. So even though from the legal perspective it all looks alike, the mechanics behind might be different. You might have people who honestly feel very offended if they themselves were um, in the concession camp and then they uh, listen or hear or read about the camp. But it also might be, in a way, instrumentalized with apparatus that is maybe not directly state apparatus, but in a way linked to the state, even though the legal tools uh, would be the same. Just as a short comment to this. First of all, th uh, Francesco Trupia from Nicolae Copernicus University. Um, first of all, thank you all for the presentations. They've been very interesting. But I have uh, two precise questions for, for Petra. Um, it's just nothing complicated, just something out of curiosity. Um, did it happen in, uh, in, in Czech Republic and Slovakia that some uh, monuments have been replaced with other statues or monuments? And if so, how? Um, and did it happen that in, in both countries, so in post-Czechoslovakian spaces, um, some monuments have been kept there because they were conveying a message of related to the nation, to the state? I'm asking this because uh, if I um, understood correctly, you did something also according to Bulgarian uh, and Bulgaria. Uh -huh. So you know, for instance, why I'm asking this, because like in, in Sofia, <laughs> there was the monument um, in NDK, like in the nearby the monument of the victim of communism, where they erased um, the, a, a very ugly monument that, which was not finished, and they replaced it with a very, not a big lion, but a lion with the map of the uh, Bulgaria Natrimoreta, like the Bulgaria on three seas, you know, this idea of expanding Bulgaria from the Adriatic Sea to the Black Sea and also the Bosphorus. And uh, because uh, they managed to, to, to keep away all possible monuments in the Museum of Socialism in Bulgaria, which is almost in the periphery of, 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 of the capital, but they kept the monument of, uh, on, to the glory of the Red Army because you know, they liberated from the Turkish uh, uh, yoke, as they frame it. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, firstly, I don't think it's ugly, <laughs> the monument, and uh, uh, or it's my opinion, okay. <laughs> and uh, for the removal of the monuments from the um, initial place to another, yes. It, it works? No? It's working. Okay. Uh, do you, can you hear me? No? Well, it's, uh, it's also about our viewers, that's why we are asking. It's about recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also uh, okay, oh. wow. <laughs> uh, so from removal uh, the monument from one place to another, uh, there, are, there were several cases uh, for a monument uh, to the... Uh, I know it because it was my doctoral thesis, <laughs> I worked uh, on it, and uh, it was just removal from the very... Uh, mm, uh, very important places or a square for in the town to another smaller uh, places uh, behind the town or somewhere in the park. 
so this removal from one for, from one place to another it was very usual in the in the 90s uh, uh, and after the what you would you say about the uh, Sofia monument uh, there is a it's it's a very big problem the Soviet war memorial they are really monumental and this is this is problematic to remove it uh, as we can uh, as we can see the the all all the monuments in 90s it was removed because the people uh, uh, really didn't want to see this monument uh, uh, not more uh, and uh, now the situation is different and now the the laws and the statues of the of this monument uh, is really complicated and i know in 94 they tried to remove this uh, monument of the soviet army in uh, sofia uh, but uh, russian federation or russian the embassy, embassy started to complain it's yeah, something yeah, yeah. that happened a few years ago as well it's still ongoing the yeah discussion. it's still it's still well, yeah this discussion about removal this monument is still uh, ongoing but but uh, i think I don't know it's if it will be re removed or not. Uh, there is a this, it's a great um, case that uh, in Sofia you have this museum, open air museum for the socialist. It's called socialist art. I'm not sure it's uh, if we can say only socialist art. Uh, I was discussing this in my thesis also. <laughs> And uh, as I said, in Slovakia, we don't have the, this type of monument, and it's really pity that we, we don't have. In Hungary, you can have it also. In, in, uh, in Russia, in Lithuania, you can, uh, you can find this open air museum, and, but not in Slovakia. I don't know if in Poland you can find one, but no. <laughs> the open air museum of communist past, I mean. I don't no? Recall, <laughs> No, so he, I don't know more. We are going to the north or, <laughs> or to the west. To, uh, there are no more uh, open air museums. If I may add something else, um, now in Bulgaria they are uh, repairing the Buzluja, the UFO, yeah. um, which is of course away from the capital, but has been discussed also how to use it afterwards because they are renovating and you know repairing it uh, mainly from scratch. And what is the use you are going to do of this kind of complex? Because it's a complex on the top of the mountains, and uh, you know the discussion has been opened. And of course, I mean all possible political implications of what should we do with this kind of monuments, and what kind of messages they still uh, convey in uh, to the to the wider public. And yeah, uh, I think it's a great uh, example how to work with uh, with this type of monument from the from the past. Uh, that we we try to reconstruct, but not to honor it, but to show how it worked before. That it's it's like an educative uh, material from the next generation, and this is a great story. Uh, I think it, uh, the woman from Berlin, she she tried to uh, do a lot of stuff uh, with with the reparation, and uh, I know the mosaics now were repaid and. <laughs> Uh, I hope that other, and I think the Berlin or other cities of uh, East German uh, also uh, are very, uh, uh, worked, works very great. Do we have, <coughs> do we have any more questions? Professor Kaminski. For the um, uh, case as such, uh, when looked, when per perceived uh, from, the per from the perspective of the European Convention of Human Rights and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, there are two different situations. The first one is related to writing generally about history of a certain country. In this context, those speaking, be it journalists and other people, can be provocative can be selective in order to raise some questions because such questions are general so it is possible to concentrate on some events on some you know you know aspects on some uh, uh, um, um, s questions um, um, uh, demanding answers but when you know we have a case dealing with particular 
with a particular person. All speaking, be it again, journalists, researchers, should be diligent. They cannot be selective. They cannot be provocative. They are writing. They are speaking about a certain person. So they are obliged to present all evidence. That's the different situation. These, these two are kinds of speech. General speech about history and you know, um, discussion about a particular individuals are different types of, you know, um, uh, expressions and they uh, need different legal standards. And it was missing in both the, sec the first instance decision judgment and the second, the appeal um, judgment. And I hoped there would be a uh, third instance, so uh, an appeal on points of law, the cassation appeal in this case, but it's not the um, story because um, the plaintiff, Ms. Leszczynska, died. So we are left with very, very problematic judgments, both rendered in the first, judge, in the first instance and in the appeal. So that was only a comment. Just to quickly uh, respond, of course, uh, yes, I agree with this because this case was exceptional mainly because it was built up so much. This was, if this was only about infringement of personal rights, then if this was only about the uh, diligence of the historians, if this was only about, but it rose up to the pride of the nation and therefore, uh, Maybe because of this, we have these rulings that do not satisfy either of the sides, actually, because it's not all in favor of uh, researchers who are doing, who, are, who just want to do research on the historical event. It's not all in favor of people who are uh, protecting themselves or their close to one uh, against defamation. It did not meet the uh, standards. It, it kind of reassured us maybe that okay, there, um, we cannot put this, this uh, nationality game in every, uh, every aspect, but still it wasn't satisfactory to either of the sides. I can totally agree with that. Do we have more questions or interventions? If we do not have, then I would like one more time to thank our speaker on this panel. And well, we have a short break now, right? Before we uh, jump uh, to the last panel. So I invite everyone for a short coffee break. Uh, 10 minutes should be enough, I guess, because we are slightly lagging behind. Thank you. Then 